Robert Candlish, from 18, lived from 1806 to 1873, was a Scottish preacher and a professor in the 19th century. He proved to be a leading figure in the disruption of 1843 and thus in the Free Church of Scotland. After receiving his doctorate from Princeton, he became the principal of New College, Edinburgh. His first John Commentary was, among many, was one among many of his works published. It went for, uh, first went to print in 1870, just a few years before his death. We will review this book, this work, by first examining its contents and structure, and secondly, by considering its contribution. The value of the work lies primarily in its thoroughness and pastoral emphasis. Spurgeon commended the work as being, quote, devout, candid, prudent, and forceful, end quote. The commentary consists of 46 chapters, most of which cover only two or three verses at a time. So the, can, you, can you remind us how many pages is this commentary, roughly? 540, maybe? Okay. A few of the chapters also overlap verses. He roughly outlines each chapter, but the outlines are more homiletical than exegetical. This stems from Candlish's purpose in writing the volume. In the preface, he states that the commentary began as a series of lectures given over a number of years, and the work reflects that lecture style. Candlish admits he did not intend to write, quote, anything like a critical commentary. I do not quote authors or discuss their views or, and opinions. I attempt no minute analysis of text, nor an elaborate verbal and grammatical construing of them, end quote. Rather, he simply wanted to, quote, bring out the general scope and tenor of the Apostles' teaching as simply and clearly as I can, end quote. The work begins with two chapters which cover the first four verses of the epistle. Candlish elaborates on John's purpose and goal for writing. John declares that all may have fellowship with the Father and with his Son, and that their joy would be complete in this fellowship. Candlish explains how John then gives three conditions or elements of this fellowship. The first condition for fellowship is light, found in 1.5 through 228. The second condition is righteousness in 229 through 46. The third condition is love, 47 through 51. Each of these elements of fellowship are founded on the declarations of God's character. For John writes that God is light, 1.5, God is righteous, 2.29, and God is love, 4.8. Candlish emphasizes the need for our lives to align with God's character if we are to have fellowship with Him. He writes, quote, For it is an indispensable condition of this fellowship with God that we realize in ourselves and in our doings what is in accordance with His nature, end quote. Therefore, these three conditions constitute the first three of four major sections in the book. Candlish sees the final section of the book, 5, 2 through 31, that should be 21, as showing how the three elements of fellowship overcome the world and the devil. Candlish offers many valuable insights to the study of 1 John. Because of the sermon style of the work, Candlish thinks like a pastor. He does not... Uh, he does not so much bring out specific applications from the text as he regularly writes from the position of the average believer wrestling with the truth of the text. For example, he writes on page 55, commenting on 1 John 1, 9, quote, I may think that when I go to commune with God my Father, with my God and Father, I am to leave all my cares and troubles behind me on the threshold and meet Him in some lofty region of spiritual peace where sorrow and sin are to find no place. But I am deceiving myself. Let me rather, taking him at his word, try the more excellent way of carrying with me always in the full confidence of loving fellowship into the secret place of my God and all that is upon my mind, my conscience, my heart. End quote. He also writes with a personal feel that is easy to relate to and often including himself as he explains the outworking of the truth. This work was strengthened by the author's regular returning to the theme of the book. He does not let the reader forget that all that John writes is for the purpose of his fellowship with the Father and the Son. This gives the work continuity and helps the reader see the forest in the midst of the trees. Candlish's use of language is interesting. On the one hand, his 19th century vocabulary and style make it hard to read in places, on the other hand, he frequently uses word pictures and puts matters simply so his point is easily grasped. It was encouraging to see that even though his 
this work is older, he is not completely dependent on the King James Version. Although the KJV is the textual basis of the commentary, he is not afraid to correct it according to the critical evidence of earlier manuscripts. This is seen most clearly in his rejection of 1 John 5, 7, which is in the KJV, but understood by all scholars as a late addition to the original. The theology of Candler stands within the Reformed tradition and provides a richness to his observations and expositions. His Trinitarianism is not merely confessional, confessional for it streams from the pages. He also sets forth a high view of God in his holiness, purity, and sovereignty. His commentary is recommended as a robust theological and pastoral contribution to 1 John studies. So would you be likely to use it in uh, sermon preparation? Most definitely. Would. Do you own it? I do. Did you buy it for this class? I actually had it for this class. My pastor recommended it to me when I was taught in my youth group. So. And when you say his Trinitarianism is not merely confessional, what, what do you mean by that? Uh, meaning it's, it's not just something that uh, he says, oh yeah, I, I believe in the Trinity, um, but that you see it um, come out in the outworking of his explanation of the text um, as he um, explains the role of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Okay. It's a slightly unusual use of the word confessional. Uh, because it it's, it's, makes it sound sort of pejorative, as if right, if right. you if you are a confessional Trinitarian, uh -huh. there's a problem. Right. Um, so I don't know. I'd probably cast about for a different way of saying that, because it makes it sound like you got something against people that are confessional Trinitarians. Right. You know that that's a that's a dangerous place to be just to be a confessional Trinitarian. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. any any other comments or questions that you might have? 19th century resource. I'm going to guess it's one of those things you could probably go online and and you know go on Amazon and get cheap used. I'm just just guessing. Yes. Free on monergism. Free on monergism. There we go. So don't waste your money. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right, so the numbers that I had for 322 are 10, 3, 11, 5, 5, 9, 3, 10, 1, 2, 3, 5, 10, 1, 4, 9, 3, and 5. And a Questions on the numbers? Uh, a question about the how to stop. So as an adjective, can it also be considered as a noun? So it could be a four adjective. If you end up translating it, we do the things that are pleasing which it looks like you do in your preliminary, because of your things, right? Then you've made arista a substantive, so you need a two after the four. Any other number issues? By the way, uh, somebody brought up a question on, on the labeling, and you know, I, I, I hope you appreciate that it, it, it breaks the sentence down and you know makes you account for every word. Uh, if you do it at least this week and maybe do it through some months or a few years ahead, obviously when you read the Greek New Testament and you're, you're preparing for a sermon, you wouldn't necessarily have to put all the numbers down because once you've done this for a while, you, you simply you recognize each word's part, part of speech as you go through. And it helps you with sight reading, it helps you with with recognition, so on and so forth. The reason I have you do underlining, which uh, Mike, yes, which Mike elected not to do in this particular version, is if you underline the verbs twice and you underline the subject nominative once, and if you put parentheses around the prepositional phrases, that, in conjunction with the numbers, it pretty much breaks the sentence down 
into edible bites. And by edible, I mean there's this magical process of moving in, in any language from a bunch of symbols, you know, in one direction or the other, and, you know, one set of characters or another. And, it, and you have some level of understanding those characters, or you wouldn't be messing with them. But you're going to move into another language. And often there, there are major differences in sentence structure and, and, and in you know, logical processes between languages. And while Greek is an Indo-European language, and it functions pretty much like English, at, at the micro level, a lot of phrases don't function like English at all. And so what students tend to do is they translate by memory. They know the English Bible. Or I suppose if you, if, you know, if, if you know Korean or you know French or whatever you know, and now you're moving into English, you still cheat. You, you just go through your native language, and then you put that over into to English. And when you underline the subjects and the verbs, and you know that in English, the basic English structure is subject, verb, object. Subject, verb, object. Or subject, verb, complement, if it's a B verb. You can take... If you had double underlined, can you double underline Lombanum in there? Yeah. Okay, and, and we know that hey mace is the implied subject. Let's just say you really didn't have a clue as to how to translate that first clause ending with up out to. Then you could just make a little template, and let me just defile your, your, your page here. <laughs> you know, you can go subject, verb, object, and you can say, excuse me, is that better? You can say subject. We, for the um, implied uh, hemes. And then you can say receive. And then you recognize that this is, uh, well, actually there's two clauses. Let me do this. I picked a bad sense to do this. this. Whatever we request, we receive from him. So we receive and this is not an object, but a prepositional phrase, from him. We receive something from him. And whatever we ask. So, I told men, it's a basic idea. Again, it's an implied subject. We ask, or we request. And the ha'a'an gives it its subju subjunctive flavor and feel. Of course, we should do this too. And then we're going to do this here, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do this, because this is an improper preposition before him or in his presence. So what I'm saying is, once you analyze things not only with the numbers but also with the underlining with the th those aren't prepositional phrase brackets those are just training wheels for another purpose then you can move into subject verb object structures in English that enable you in a very concrete way to move what you have nailed down physically into English logical sentence structure and I mean, this is very primitive here, and you, you can tamper with it. But that's why, that's why I have you do the underlining. Again, I know some of you don't underline uh, because you don't need to. First John's pretty simple. You know, you didn't need to do that underlining. I'm so sorry, I just totally forgot. No, I, I'm not, I'm not, no, I didn't. I literally didn't do this to ridicule you, although it's having that effect, isn't it? But the, the, reason, the reason I have students do it, just for, you know, some of you might end up teaching Greek sometime. And you're going to find students, and you had it happen to yourself. You, you, you look up in the lexicon every word in the verse. You know what every word means. And you have no idea what it means. You just have a bunch of words. You know, how, how, does, how do I move into an English sentence? And this is the key. Subject, verb, object. Or subject, verb, complement. And then just, you know, that, of course, then you have to know what a clause is. <laughs> You know, you have to know that 
this is the clause and this is the clause and because and you know you have to have some primitive knowledge of independent clauses and subordinate clauses and that kind of thing i can't do everything this week <laughs> but you will have to do everything for people when you teach them beginning greek or if you yourself once in a while need to go back from scratch and kind of rethink something this is a physical process in which everything in greek is identified and you have a basic template to move over into an english sentence structure and you could use it in other languages too, I suppose. I've only, you know, moved from uh, uh, from Greek into other European languages. I haven't tried to take this into Arabic. It does work in Romanian because Romanian is another Europe Indo-European language, and Romanian students have used this very well as if, as they've uh, struggled with this. Although Romanian is a highly inflected language, just like Greek is, so it's they cheat. You know, they they kind of think like the Greeks thought more than we do. So let us forge ahead a little bit. Thank you. Uh, the cross references are Matthew 7, 7 and John 14, 3. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. And it just goes along with the same theme of asking and receiving as in the verse uh, John 14, 13. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that my Father may be glorified in the Son. And so the parallel is very straightforward with both the references. For the uh, commentary, uh, comments stopped. John does not simply John does not mean to imply that God hears and answers our prayers merely for the subjective reason that we have a clear conscience and an uncondemning heart. There is an objective, moral reason, namely because we obey His commands and more generally do what pleases Him. Obedience is the indispensable condition not the meritorious cause of answered prayer. Lou adds, sometimes the promise of an answer appears to be made without qualification, but more often, as is surely implicit elsewhere, conformity of the request or of the person making it to the will of God is a necessary condition. You want to uh, push up your uh, sheet a little bit? Thus, both commentators agree that the answered prayer that John mentions here is limited to those living in obedience to God and is furthermore qualified by other parts of Scripture, particularly 1 John 5.14, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Uh, the grounded does he hear us or does he do what we ask him to do? Yeah, he, he hears us, and he can answer both uh, affirmatively and negatively. Uh, whatever we request, we receive from him. That doesn't sound like uh, a no answer. Yeah, that's a, that's a good good point that you bring up. Um, <laughs> Look, you know Greek, so you should be able to explain that. Yeah, I would say that uh, in in our prayer to God and those as those who are submitted to Him, uh, living towards the will of God, God conforms our will to His will, and we act according to His will. In that, yeah, we are conformed to that will. So that, are you saying that in the long run, taking the fuller range of, of what even John says about this, that the, the, that the whatever we ask, it's kind of implied in keeping with his will? Yes. Am I putting words in your mouth, or is that really what you thought? Um, right now, I, I don't know exactly what I thought. You asked, you asked such good questions. <laughs> 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 I'm just thinking what your church people are going to ask you when you teach First John, or maybe they'll come to you and say, you know, I read this verse and you've been gushing about First John, and I've been praying for this for 10 years. I prayed for somebody to be saved, and, and uh, they died, and they were never saved that I know of. So I, I'm just wondering, you know, what your hermeneutical pastoral strategy is for dealing with this verse. Um, and I mean, it's an unfair question. Yeah, I, I preached through this uh, last semester, and uh, I'm glad no one asked me that question. <laughs> <laughs>
But it is kind of an unfair question because it, it does tempt you to uh, load John's whole theology of prayer into that verse. And it kind of handcuffs you. It, it keeps you from, from going to the cross-references. Because you know, the additional light is shed on John's theology of prayer. He, this is not the only thing he says about it. So that's, that's the first refuge I would seek. I would say, well, be, you know, before we press this verse for an answer, let's look and see if the same writer says other things about prayer that might help us understand his view of prayer. Because maybe every time he mentions prayer, he doesn't give us everything he thinks about it. You know, maybe there are other parts of how he views prayer that would inform that. And, and then I think everything you said pretty much can be located in John's theology of prayer. Uh, the two other observations, I think, of course, when we get to chapter 5, we get into this more intensely. Uh, I don't know, somebody's already sweating bullets about that, uh, thinking about when they get to chapter 5. But um, the, the, the first consideration is, in terms of, of the foundation, it's, it's Jesus teaching to his disciples. And again, I, I, on the one hand, I don't, I don't want to make the disciples into superhumans. Uh, on the other hand, I do want to be careful about forgetting the contexts in which we see Jesus giving his followers assurances of answered prayer. And if we talk about John in the upper room, to say to the 11 who are being commissioned, really, in those verses, whatever you guys ask, I'm going to do, that's a little different, you know, from me in my fleshliness deciding I want a new pickup, which I do need, and, you know, claiming, and I need it in the next three months. And then really working very hard to obey everything he tells me to do and then getting my nose out of joint because he doesn't answer my prayer in three months when I fulfilled all the conditions, in my opinion, you know, for, for him to do this thing. In other words, you can come to God with requests that are pretty trivial. This goes back to you know, what's in the will of God. And I think you can argue that when Jesus gives these assurances, Jesus himself who taught, thy will be done when you pray, say, he, he would never have counseled people to forget that in their prayers, whatever they ask, it's got to be in keeping with God's will. That's just, it's, it's you know, a no-brainer if you understand the bigger context of Jesus' prayer life and his teaching. And as far as his prayer life, and this is my second point, all theologies of prayer have to pass the Gethsemane test. You know, and Jesus and Gethsemane prayed for something that the Father denied him. Now, he put an asterisk by his prayer. He said, if it be possible. And, you know, that's him not being hypocritical. He said, when you pray, pray, thy will be done. And so even in Gethsemane, he's saying, Father, if it be your will. But then allowing for that, take this cup from me. And, you know, it, it couldn't be done. Uh, that's a mystery. It's another one of those fulfillments of uh, uh, almost an equal mystery, I think it's Hebrews 5, I want to say 8, could be 7. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through the things he suffered. You know, and sometimes we learn obedience in prayers, and we're thinking whatever we ask, we're going to get. And we can take verses out of context and we can prove that's what the Bible says and we can create enormous difficulties for ourselves. But this is where, I mean, it's, this is where you, you, you need theological training. You need hermeneutical training. You know, you, you need time to, to reflect on things like this because prayer is huge. 
if, if God's people aren't praying, we're in trouble. And, and if we're not praying, we're in trouble. And we're always flirting with trouble because prayerlessness is probably, probably our major besetting sin. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, we're always in and out of, of, of really effective prayer. And it doesn't work like you can twist the scriptures to make it sound like it works. You know, when we all know, here at Masters, I don't have to, to, to stress, you know, name it and claim it is, it's not true. <laughs> but we also stress, we believe in the word of God. We believe it's inerrant. So that kind of puts us in a tension if you don't read the Bible contextually. You know, if you just camp on certain phrases, you can create the illusion that there was a carte blanche back there. There is a carte blanche. And if you hit the sweet spot of conformity to God's will and you meet all the conditions, whatever you ask, you'll get. Which, I mean, just logically, that means if you don't get it, you haven't met all the conditions. And, and, you know, and, and then you get a man-centered view of prayer. But what's, I think the main thing that keeps us from that is just going back to the Lord's Prayer and thinking about it and combining that with how Jesus lived out his prayer life. You know, there's also the Judas test. You know, Jesus prayed all night before he chose the 12, and one of them was Judas. Now, you know, it's easy to think, well, yeah, I mean, he was the son of perdition, and it had to happen, and there's something to that. But I think one of the things that Jesus must have wrestled with was, am I making a mistake here? <laughs> Is this really, you want me to choose somebody that is going to stab us in the back? Choose a traitor? Or maybe he didn't, maybe it really hadn't become clear at this point who, who, who Judas really was, but maybe he had the intuition to know there's something fishy about this guy. I mean, I don't know. But just this dynamic of Jesus getting up at night, and, you know, where is he? He's out praying somewhere. I mean, does that sound like somebody who's really resting in the Father? Does it sound like he's abiding? You know, there's a time for everything, and there's a time to abide and be at peace and sleep, and there's a time to stay up all night agonizing before the Father. You know, and if it was as simple as to say, whatever you ask, you'll get. He wouldn't have been up all night agonizing before the Father. <laughs> Because there's this question of, well, what should, what, what should we be asking? And what is the will of the Father? And, and how, you know, back to you, how can I be aligning myself? And what, you know, what do I even want? I mean, sometimes, as Paul says in Romans 8, we don't know how to pray. We, we, we don't know what, what we should ask for. So it's well and good to pray, pray, pray. But then what, what, what if you don't know what the best thing to pray for is? And yet, you got to pray. So this verse is, you know, not a, a one-step solution, uh, and, and we want it. We want to keep it in the context of John's theology of prayer and the theology of prayer of the one from whom he learned to pray. And never let us, never let yourself get boxed into the corner of one verse on prayer. You know, that's it's bad hermeneutics, but it's happened to me more than once because along with assurance you know being a question many people ask you over the years in ministry another question they'll ask you is about prayer and unanswered prayer and while it is true i think that you know it's effectively sometimes god's answer to our prayers is no i think that you know that 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 popular sort of trick answer to say well he answers all prayer Yes, no, and later. That's kind of infuriating. It's kind of an infuriating answer. And, and it trivializes a very real problem that sometimes people who've been mistaught, you know, they really do think they're, they're fulfilling, the, they really do think it's a, if I fulfill all the conditions, I can ask whatever I want, and he'll do it. That's, that's what they're taught, and then they do it, and it's a crisis of faith for them. And you come up with a glib answer. Well, he just told you no. 
I mean, even if you don't sneer at them when you tell them. <laughs> you know, that, that's not, it's not really intellectually satisfying. You know, it makes people think this is a hoax. This whole thing's a sham. And the problem is they're coming at it in a more simplistic way than, than life is. And then Jesus, then Jesus lived it. Jesus didn't live a simplistic life. You know, the, there's a blanket term for, for this approach to Christianity, and I find it very helpful. It's triumphalism. Triumphalism. You know, and you just string together a bunch of slogans. We're more than conquerors. And whatever we ask, we receive. And you sing victory in Jesus. And you, you, just, you just harp on all the positive aspects. And especially, you know, if you're not, if you don't have cancer... And if you're living in a land of plenty, and if you're not unemployed, and if your kid isn't diagnosed with some incurable disease, you know, and, and if you've got enough blessings in and around you, which a lot of people in North America do and have had for generations, this sells. It sells like hotcakes. And you can build mega churches on triumphalism and then throw in the American flag for good measure. And that's churchianity. That's Western churchianity. And the problem is, you know, when I go to Africa, one of the biggest things I have to fight is Trinity Broadcast Network. Because a lot of the Africans who are coming into the church, that's, where they're, they're, that's what they're getting. That's what they think it is. You know, they think it's a form of name it and claim it. And it deeply infects our churches. And it's, at pr it's one reason why people don't pray, because it doesn't work. You know, the false teachings of prayer they get, they don't produce the results that they want, so they don't, they're prayerless. But the real teaching on prayer, prayer is so much more fulfilling when it's part of the real struggle of the real world. And it really is a primary means by which we connect with the true and living God. Because he really is God, and his ways are above our ways, and his thoughts are beyond our thoughts. And yet he says, come, let us reason together. We do that in prayer. You know, we, we reason with God as, as best we can. Of course, we're informed by the word of God. So, you know, we're, we're grounded. we got something to work with, like, like Jesus did. He was grounded in the word of God. He had something to work with. He didn't go with, you know, flights of fancy to God the Father. Having said that, he wrestled in prayer. Because he wanted to know, Lord, what should I be asking? If it's possible, I mean, I don't want to overlook the possibility here that maybe there's a plan B. That's really your plan A. And I'm, I'm just getting around to seeing it. If I were facing taking on the sins of the world, I'd be, I'd be grasping for straws too. But the Father just confirmed, no, this, you're right. This, this is your destiny. You know, and so then he got up and found his disciples sleeping and, you know, didn't, didn't let that feel that he'd been a failure as a teacher. <laughs> I mean, that, that could kind of like be a blow to your ego. You know, the dramatic pinnacle of your ministry as the founder of the church. And, and at that hour, you know, you're, you're three hand-picked guys who are going to help you, you know, be the prayer warrior at the great hour of need. You know, they're like asleep. <laughs> what? You couldn't stay awake for an hour? <laughs> oh, gee, you know, ah, we blew it again. <laughs> it's, it's, it's almost funny, you know. The juxtaposition of uh, just the, the the bumbling, stumbling disciples, and you know Jesus and his uh, his pristine uh, focus on his task. But it, it, it's such a uh, it's such a script, you know, for us to keep before us as as we think about prayer and, and Jesus' true victory in prayer, which you know true victories in the Christian faith are, are always cruciform. You know, we have a theology of the cross. We don't have a theology of glory. We're not triumphalists. We, we, we understand you know, that, that, that there's a dark and there's a difficult side to 
the progress of God's reign in our lives. They're, they're, we're going to be paying prices. And the, the, the words of Stott are that good, you know, not prices of merit, but, but there, there are necessary entailments. You know, uh, the devil's going to take chunks out of us. He was taking some chunks out of Jesus that he was, his sweat was like blood. I, I don't know what that means. It, it wouldn't feel good, I, I'll bet. But he, he hung in there. So, uh, did you give your ground insight yet? Not yet. One must never expect to have his prayers answered by God if he is living in disobedience to God. In general, God answers the prayers of those who seek to please him and live consistent lives of obedience. Next verse. Um, so, 323, 10, 3, 5, 1, 2, 3, 9, 5. Hold it. Ina? It would be 10. There we go. Um, uh, toe is one, two, one, two, three, two, two, ten, five, three, eight, five, two, and three. And if somebody wants to put a ten for Kathos, it is permitted. Uh, you gotta you gotta move your sheet up for us. Uh, cross references. A new commitment I give to you that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. John six twenty nine. Jesus answered them, "This is the work of God that you believe in Him, whom He has sent." And John fifteen seventeen. These things I command you, so that you love one another. And it has the same theme of this is the commandment, and that is love, loving one another. Uh, Commentary and grammar interaction. Sad accepts the aorist variant piscusomen uh, rather than the present piscuomen, which you can see up in the verse over here. Which over in this this for the the uh, public domain version has the uh, present. So the present was in the uh, Byzantine. Tradition and the Nestle Allant has the aorist. Uh, seeing a marked distinction between it and the present agap omen, uh, he quotes, there's a significant difference in the tense of the two verbs, faith in Christ being here regarded as a decisive act, and love for the brothers as a continuous attitude. Lou disagrees. Whether the tenses of the verb alone can sustain this distinction is debatable. And here, even if the aorist were original, it is unlikely that there is a distinction between the continuation of love, present, and the initiation of belief. Inasmuch as the letter is addressed to those already within the community, they are being urged to maintain the belief and love. This is properly its primary characteristic. Probably you meant that. Is, right. That is properly its primary characteristic. Right. But that, um, did you cut, cut and paste that? No, I, I haven't figured out how to cut and paste from a Kindle. Okay. So. Actually, I think I would agree with Lou that it's probably, um, it was probably stylistic on, on John's part. Final translation. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he commanded us. So this is the case where Hina acts like Hati. It wouldn't make a lot of sense to translate in order that here. But this is a, just a Johnny, a Johannine feature. It's also in the gospel that he has Hinas that sometimes they function like Hatis. Yes, Rich? Who would find it difficult to believe in Jesus? Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, who would find it difficult? Is it is it uh, rabbinical Jews who are still wondering whether or not Jesus was the Messiah? And John here is saying that you have to believe in Jesus, or, or what? 
Well, he's relating it back to his prayer teaching. Notice the commandments, tas and talas, in verse 22. And he's talking about doing the things that are pleasing to him, but then he immediately reflects Jesus' teaching. I think it's in maybe John 6 where people say, what should, what works should we do? Or what should we do? Basically to please God. And he says, you should believe. That's the work of God, that you believe. So I, I think, you know, he feels the possible uh, distortion of what he's just said, that commandment keeping is... The, the, the secret to answered prayer. And he wants to make sure that we understand that the first command is to be in a right relationship with God. Because if we're in a right relationship with God, then we're in a position to discern his will, and that sanctifies our acts of righteousness. For one thing, it ensures that we're not going to be using them as a bribe. You know, when you're in a union with God through faith in Christ, on paper, you should understand that your righteousness is not leverage. Your acts of heroic piety, you know, your self-denial, you're gashing yourself with stones, your fasting, it's not necessary for you to do those things to suffer enough to get God to do what you want. Now, you may need to fast, it's part of your spiritual discipline to help clear your mind so that you can discern the will of God. That's a different thing from doing meritorious things to pile up favor so God will do what you want. Which is, as you just implied, Mike, in your explanation, and as Stott was dealing with, you know, in his explanation of the previous verse, we want, we want to make sure we don't link answers to prayer to meritorious acts. So he goes into the commandment right after that, that we believe. And love one another. You know, as, you know, and that's bringing in the Z coordinate to make sure we don't distort the X coordinate. It's not just the X coordinate. And of course, the love one another is both the Z and the Y coordinate. It's both ethics and affection. Having stated that obedience is the key to answered prayer, John now defines what God's command to obedience truly is, believing in Christ and loving other Christians. Doctrine, obedience, and love are a package. One who is an expert in Christology but refuses to have compassion on people in need is without Christ. Similarly, one who is a Mormon and has great love for his family is still totally lost. And that really just confirms and fleshes out what, what I just said. So, good insight. The numbers we look at are uh, 10, <laughs> 1, 6, 1, 2, 3, 9, 3, 5, 10, 3, 9, 3, 10, 9, 3, 5, 10, 5, 9, 3, 9, 1, 2, 3, 3, 5. Okay. Cross references? John 6, 56. Why would they notice, uh, notice the underlying in there? <laughs> okay. Which one? The ooh? I think it's a relative pronoun. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It, it, but, that, but that's worth pointing out that uh, that is a, a rough breathing mark, right? Yeah. Because uh, it can be an adverb meaning where. But here, it's not a negative. It's a relative pronoun. John 6.56, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks of my blood and abides in me, and I in him. In Romans 8.9, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ 
does not belong to him. And that's just kind of parallel with the reference to the spirit towards the end of, of verse 24. Commentary and grammar interaction. We, we need some uh, elevation here. Thank you. It says, Stott. It may at first seem that this reference to the Holy Spirit within us introduces a subjective criterion of assurance which is inconsistent with what has gone before. But this is not so. The Spirit whose presence is the test of Christ living in us manifests himself objectively in our life and conduct. It is he who inspires us to confess Jesus as the Christ come in the flesh, as John immediately proceeds to show. Final translation, and the one who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And we know by this that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. Okay. Oh, go ahead. You're, uh, yeah. Um, it is easy to confuse John's words here to mean that the Spirit is an additional proof of one's abiding, as it almost seems to say that at face value. However, this oft-used expression, pi en tuto, perhaps does not refer to what comes after, but to what precedes. Specifically, the abiding that goes hand in hand with the commandment keeping that he just mentioned. Thus, the Spirit is not per se a proof that one is abiding, but the means by which God allows us to know that we are abiding through our obedience. In place of ek, with some license, if you'll if you allow me that license here, I don't know if you will, one might use the English preposition through instead of by, i.e., and we know by this that he abides in us through the Spirit whom he has given us. And I actually, I looked up Eck and BDAG. I didn't find a gloss uh, that said through. But, and obviously I wouldn't, that's why I didn't translate it that way. But I want to give that sense that this, this having the spirit in this sense, as, as Stott was talking, was saying that it was, uh, it was not subjective at all, that the spirit would be an assurance of salvation. And on some level, I... I don't know if I, either I don't understand them 100% correctly or I don't know if I agree with them 100% because it does seem somewhat subjective that someone would say, I know that I'm saved because I have the Spirit. And you know, what does that mean? How do you prove that you have the Spirit? It's not something objective like... How do you even prove it to yourself? Exactly. Um, and so I thought that the Spirit here is not necessarily a proof of that assurance, but the Spirit is what enables us to understand that we have that assurance as it's referring back to the, how the Spirit shows us that we are obedient to God. Uh, I don't know if that totally made sense that traveled mess. I should have uh, written it down rather than trying to articulate it, but... Uh, well, you should have capitalized English, that's for sure. <laughs> the English preposition. Oh, yes, I should. So that's one problem with your explanation yeah. there. But as far as through, you know, I would avoid that because you've got dia for that, and he doesn't okay. use dia. However, when you think of ek, that does lend itself to an understanding often as uh, on the basis of or as a result of, which comes then very close logically to what we mean by through. So however you translate it, I, I I mean, I personally agree with your explanation, and I don't agree with Stott's explanation here. Now, I don't know what I said in my commentary, but today, I don't agree with Stott on this. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, 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 think, I think you've done a good, do I agree with you on this? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, I think you've done a good job, apparently, because you're paraphrasing me. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was wondering whether I should put Yarborough in. And do I, do I put, do I suggest through? Surely. You didn't say through. That, okay. I just pulled that out of the air. Uh, I'd slit my wrists if I'd done that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but you see, uh, when when you study Paul, just a little parallelism here, uh, Paul is religious about avoiding um, that we're saved, dia, tain, piston. 
because of faith. He always uses dia pisteos, through faith. Faith is never the cause of our salvation. It's the means. And sometimes it's piste with no article. Dative. Dative of means. I'm so glad. Otherwise he'd be a semi-Pelagian. But for stylistic variation, a synonym in Paul for diates pistaos is ek pistaos. And I don't think anybody translates the ek pistaos as through faith, but it's, it's synonymous with through faith. And so you can translate it by faith. But I, I, you know, when I teach Paul, I, I, I harp on the problem in English of by, which is also a problem in Romanian with prin. And you, if you've got other languages, check your prepositions here. Because by in English can either be semi-Pelagian or it can be Augustinian. If you say you're saved by faith and you mean my faith is what I bring to the table and you're a synergist, then faith becomes part of how you're saved. You're saved because of your faith. If you're an Augustinian, then you understand by as dia, with the genitive, through faith. That's the Reformation right there. The accusative or the genitive is the difference between uh, Pelagius and Augustine, or between Luther and Erasmus. So, I, you know, I, th I think you're, however we handle the translation, uh, I would avoid through, but I think the explanation works. And, and it's not to deny that the Holy Spirit serves to give us assurance. But here, I don't think, I think that's more of a Pauline idea that, or maybe an, uh, an idea from something in Acts or something that's kind of brought in to help explain this verse, and I, I don't think that's a, a good methodology here. My numbers, 4-2, 11, 4, 2, 5, 10, 5, 1, 2, 10, 9, 1, 2, 5, 10, uh, 10 4, 2, 5, 9, 1, 2. Any questions on the numbers? Okay. Cross reference analysis. This first one is Matthew 24 24, where false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders. <clears throat> so as to lead astray if possible, even the elect. Here Jesus warns his disciples that there will be false Christs and prophets who will lead people astray. And also Revelations 2.2, 2, I know your works, your toil and your patient, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. So Jesus commends the church for testing those who call themselves apostles. <clears throat> okay, and and uh, I see there that that's A P, right? Oh yeah. It's not a, it's not A P O C. It's just A P. Okay. In Nestle Allah. And now for the commentary or grammar interaction, according to Lou, the false prophets are those who falsely claim prophetic authority and one who propounds lies. She develops this understanding from 1 John 2.18 and Jeremiah 23.28-29. Stott agrees by calling them the mouthpiece of the spirit of error. He, com he contrasts them to true prophets who are the mouth of spirit and truth. Um, uh, 
fun. So here's my final translation. Beloved, do not believe in every spirit, but test the spirit if it is from God, because many false prophets have come out into the world. Um, is there a reason why you said believe in? Why should you take it out? Oh, I mean, I mean, you put it in. I was, I was wondering why, why it's there, and, it, and if, if it's not there, why isn't it there? I mean, do you, do you think do you think that he's warning them about believing in spirits or believing spirits? It's two, you know, it's two different things, right? Yeah. One is like putting your faith in them, and another is giving them credence. Yeah, I think, that's uh, I think what you'll find if you if you do some work with pistuo, the pistuo with the dative normally means not the same thing as pistuo for example, in John with ace. When John use, uses believe, ace, say, tan ye zun, believe into Jesus. We just say believe in Jesus. That means put your trust in something. And actually, it's virtually, it's virtually uh, novel in the New Testament. It, this was not a, a Hellenistic Greek expression, to believe ace somebody. It's, it's kind of coined for New Testament usage. But there are times in the New Testament where um, pistio is used with the dative and it, it means to give credence to. In other words, don't believe every spirit. He's not warning them about putting their personal faith in spirits for salvation. He's warning them against thinking that what they say might be true. So in that case, you don't want the in there. So that should be taken out. Yeah, do not believe every spirit, which would mean don't give them credence. I think we can. I think we can uh, do that mentally. Okay. If, if I can find my pen, I'll, I'll lend it to you in this circumstance. Oh, thank you. But don't everybody else think I'm going to give you a pen. <laughs> Uh, insight. Uh, we are not to believe every spirit who comes in the name of Christ. Every person who comes. No, no, oh, you read it. Oh, okay. you're, you're flustered. Okay. So. Uh, every person who comes in the name of Christ, instead we are to test them to see if they are from God. Stott exhorts Christians to see the need for discernment. We see an example of this in Berea when the noble minded searched the scripture and examined Paul's teaching. But, not saying that it's Paul's prophet. Yeah, sure. All right, next verse. Um, okay. Um, verse 2, 9, 3, 5, 1, 2, 1, 2, 4, 2, 3, 5, 2, 2, 9, 2, 6, 9, one, two, five. And what tense is the six there? Six. Uh, that was um, a perfect. From what verb? Um, <coughs> at the, or uh, Urkumai. From Urkumai. Good. Reference analysis. Um, Matthew 10 32. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. Romans 10 9. Be because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 1 Corinthians 12 3. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is a curse. And no one um, can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, these verses correlate 
with um, John's mention of confession. Jesus examines, uh, explains in Matthew that those who confess Christ will be acknowledged by the Father because of Him. Paul says if we confess that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. If, in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, if we confess Jesus is Lord, we are in His Holy Spirit. Moving forward to commentary of Abraham interaction, what does it mean for Jesus to come in the flesh? According to Louis, does not signify des destination, designation, but mode and location. Uh, Louis one six, uh, six seven. Stott also mentions that the perfect tense seems to emphasize that the flesh assumed by the Son of God in the incarnation has become his permanent possession. For my final translation, um, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit who confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is um, from God. Does this mean? I mean, to, to sort of visualize this, is he talking about, say, when Christians gathered and um, they shared that there would be people who would uh, confess Christ that they, he's come in the flesh and, and he's saying when people confess that that's because of a spirit namely God's spirit is that what's going on there or, or is is he talking about spirit possession, in a way? No. How, are the, how are these spirits confessing Jesus? Um, maybe, I think, I think um, that is explicitly to verse 3, exactly what that confession is. Um, it's, uh, so these aren't, these aren't people in, a, in the spirit, these are actually spirits? Under the influence of spirits? Um, if, we're, if we're in Christ, maybe under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And if we're not? If we're not, then in the influence of... Uh, of we become false prophets. Yeah. Because we're influenced by spirits that are lies, yeah. liars. Yeah. Okay? I'm just trying to put this, you know, into concrete focus. Okay. Yeah, so, um, ground inside... Yeah. How do we know if someone is from God or not? If that person confesses Jesus, the God man came in the flesh. No. If that person confesses Jesus, the God man came in the flesh. His thought comments that this is the fundamental, fundamental Christian doctrine which can never be compromised. Yes. Verse. Final verse. So, verse three, ten, four, two, three, eleven, five, one, two, nine, one, two, eleven, five. 10, 3, 5, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 10, 5, 10, 8, 9, 1, 2, 5, 8. Questions on the numbering? Okay. Reference and analysis. <clears throat> uh, Second John seven. For many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. 
Here we see that the Antichrist is also described as the deceiver. Um, Matthew 10, 33. Whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before the Father who is in heaven. If we deny Christ, he would deny us before his Father. Um, whoever, and then John 8, 47. Whoever is of God, hears the word of God. The reason why we do not hear them is that they are not from God. So we see that you know, those who are from God do not hear the words of God. Finally, uh, Scott uh, observes that in chapter 2, 18 and 23, John teaches that, that on our confession or denial of the Son depends on whether we possess the Father or not. However, in this chapter, it depends on whether we have the Spirit. Finally, um, every spirit who does not confess Jesus is not from God, and this one is the Antichrist, which you have heard that is coming, even now is in the world already. Um, Go back to your, yeah, yes, Rich. I had a question about what does antichrist mean? Does it mean one who opposes Christ? Or does it mean a substitute Christ? Both. I think that's the conclusion I come to, that both those things are true about these figures. Uh, in your translation, yeah. um, you make something a little simpler than the Greek. Just, you can just leave the translation in there because I think we're all looking at Greek texts ourselves. And, and if you look at the Greek text, uh, middle of the verse, kai tu ta esten ta tu antichristu. So it just doesn't say, and this is the Antichrist. It says this is the of the Antichrist. And there's an ellipsis there, right? He leaves a word out. What does he leave out? These are Numa. So for some reason, you've translated this one is the Antichrist, and it says in Greek, and this one is of the Antichrist. Or you could say this one is the spirit of the Antichrist. So this should be this one uh, is of the Antichrist? You know, probably the best thing would be to say this one is the spirit of the Antichrist. Because it's it's there by virtue of the ta. He doesn't need to put pneuma in because it would be pedantic to repeat it for him. But this is the, the, the benefit of an inflected language. You know, you can say more with fewer explicit words. You wouldn't use the subject title the ta in that case. Would you take this one to say this is? So are you saying maybe it should be a one two? No, I'm just saying there, just in this translation, it's put in. Uh, and this is the spirit of Antichrist. Rather than this one, because now you've got essentially you're using your you know, Yeah, you can say this is the spirit of the Antichrist. But you could go both ways with that. This this one. Because tuta is this this thing, this, it's neuter. Yeah. Neuter says so. This thing, this spirit, this one, is the spirit of the Antichrist. So, you know, in English, you could go both ways there. This or this one. Yeah. Yeah, and you translate it as an and in your preliminary. Yeah. Like I. I with my final translation, I was looking over, I was like, oh, this is too redundant, so I changed it to each. Okay. So make sure, you know, that your 8 or your 10 corresponds with your, your translation. Do that later. Do it later, right. Okay. Ground insight? Yeah, ground insight. Um, since there are antichrists in the world already, 
We must be on our guard. We must test every spirit. And if they do not confess Jesus is from God, we must not believe them. Of course, there are spirits that confess that Jesus is from God. Jehovah Witnesses say Jesus is from God. Mormons say Jesus is from God. So just because people say Jesus is from God, I mean, people can lie all day long. So just like, you know, an individual statement in John on spirit and confessing in Jesus, you can't take that out of the broader context of other things he says on that. And uh, just like on prayer. So I always love to hear people confess that Jesus is from God or from the Son of God or whatever, but uh, you, you can counterfeit Christian confession. You deserve a hand of applause too, Luke.